On December 6, 2017, the Google acquired company specializing in machine learning, known as DeepMind, put their chess software, AlphaZero, up against the world's strongest chess engine, Stockfish, and this was game three. We start with Knight F3, and one thing that we're going to note throughout this entire video series, this match that we're covering between AlphaZero and Stockfish, is that AlphaZero seemed to take a surprisingly human, or we'll call it positional chess approach, against the world's deepest and fastest calculator. We have a Queen's Indian here on the table. We're going to talk about just how deep the theory went between these two uh, mecha machines. Here after queen to c2, c5, and d5, we see a very well-known positional pawn sacrifice in the queen's Indian. White's idea is that by giving up the d5 pawn, black is going to struggle from there on out to deal with the potential pressure along the d file. Combine that with the fact that black has to lose a, a bit of time in order to safely take this d5 pawn, retreating this bishop to the diagonal that it didn't originally develop to, is one of the key ideas behind white's line here. For example, after e takes, d5, c takes, capturing the pawn immediately is not an option for black due to queen e4 check, which will either win the knight or win the rook on a8 after black retreats the knight to e7. So of course Stockfish is uh, not going to fall for that, and rather than taking the pawn on d5, after bishop the bishop backs up to b7, white plays bishop to g2, now we can safely take on d5, castles knight to c6, Rook to d1 and bishop e7. This game is all theory, played many times by grandmasters and amateur chess players of all levels. Bishop to e7 pointing out the fact that white cannot safely take this, uh, this piece on d5 due to knight to b4. So in case you're wondering just how many blunders are these computers going to make out of the opening, they are not actually making blunders just yet. So after bishop e7, white of course does not take and instead plays the move queen f5. Again, still following theory, and white's goal over the next series of moves is to try to coordinate the pieces in such a way that the d-file and potentially the queen side pieces will not be well coordinated uh, in order to prevent white from developing compensation over on this side of the board, particularly the king side and maybe a long-term king side attack. This is, again, the common theme behind this positional sacrifice of the d5 pawn in the queen's indium. But again, this is not necessarily news, especially to our advanced players. After e4, again, you're just trying to anchor in the potential weaknesses here on d5 and d6. g6, queen f4, castles, e5, all theory, all played many times. After knight to h5, queen to g4, the move rook to e8 is officially our first novelty, quote unquote, played by Stockfish. Moves that have been played previously include uh, numerous queen maneuvers, queen to b8, a move that gets the queen off the d-file, tries to put pressure on the pawn here. Queen to c8, also getting the queen off the d-file and trying to avoid moves like rook takes d7 with a whole lot of fun. Uh, the move that had been played most commonly is the move d5 in this position. Now, interesting that Stockfish didn't play the move that has been played by Ivanchuk uh, and other strong grandmasters. After d5, one of the most well-known games is e takes d6, bishop to f6, and after the move knight to c3, speaking of Ivanchuk, he played the move knight to d4 against Magnus Carlsen at the Amber Blindfold and Rapid Chess Festival back in 2007. Uh, but after knight takes d4, bishop takes g2, Magnus surprised with the interesting idea knight f5, not capturing back on g2, but putting the knight on f5 and uh, keeping this long-term compensation of the d-pawn, Magnus went on to win a very nice game against Ivanchuk. So maybe Alpha Zero or Stockfish were both studying up on this line and decided not to go for it. Bishop takes d6 is also a move, of course, after d5, but after knight c3, queen b8. I quoted a game here by Wang Yu where after queen a4 and knight to d5, he went on to win also in a nice attacking fashion against John Rousen, another grandmaster. So those are just a couple games to give you some context in regards to the type of game that can happen here, where white, even at the end of lines like this, as you can see, white's down a pawn, but the compensation is based on a number of long-term factors. Lack of coordination of the pieces on the queen side, potential attacking chances against all of the dark squares on the king's side. Uh, and again, just overall, white having a more active
pressure being exerted on the position. And uh, again, these are these are the types of words. If you listen to the semantics that I'm saying, that are almost describing abstract types of compensation and, and features of the position. And as we dive into these games here by Alpha Zero against Stockfish, we're going to see that this is a common theme that yours truly, who has pretty much spent the last 48 hours obsessed with these games, uh, I, I've noticed about Alpha Zero's approach, his willingness to play for long-term compensation and sacrifice material. Something that we've been waiting for computers or let's say machines learning to understand in the way that humans do. Uh, so really fascinating. Rookie 8 played by Stockfish, of course, a great move. Now, after knight to c3, uh, note that taking on d7 likely met by moves like queen to c8, and the point is that this is just, this is not a fun thing for white to deal with now. So uh, obviously it's something that we think about with white having compensation on the d file in the way that I've highlighted, uh, but it's not something that white is necessarily threatening. So after knight c3, queen to b8 was played, and, and this is where you first start to feel that Stockfish is losing the thread on this position. Not that queen b8 trying to hit e5 is a bad idea, or that rook e8 is really a bad novelty as compared to d5 and the moves that I highlighted that Ivanchuk or Rousen and others played. But that after queen b8, you're sort of bluffing at taking this pawn, and alpha zero just goes forward with the move knight to d5. Uh, of course, taking e5 is just not possible due to the fact that white can capture and take on e7, and in the end, Bob's your uncle with the uh, with a bishop hanging on b7. So knight to d5 is played. That means that black has to save the dark square bishop. And after bishop f4, you suddenly see again that Stockfish just doesn't like the last couple moves he played. Now with the queen on b8, there's threats of moves like e6. And taking f4 would not be ideal, even though it gets rid of a knight on the edge, mainly because white has an inner mizzo. Of course, white is going to play knight f6 check, not just take back the pony. And, uh, and that's the reason why this knight, as bad as it is on the edge and you'd love to trade it, is sort of frozen to this square because of the weaknesses on the dark square that we've been highlighting are going to be a common theme. So, uh, after bishop f4, Stockfish played queen c8, but here come the natural series of moves, developing pressure on the king side that leads to alpha zero getting a very, very clean looking attack. Uh, the move rook to d6 is coming, followed by rook to f6. This seems odd at first, but again, if you highlight the fact that not thinking the way humans do, these are just a bunch of positional weaknesses without really any concrete ability to get rid of that rook who's now lodged himself on f6. So why not put a rook on f6, let the other rook do the dirty work on the d-file, and again, continue to try to pry open the king side. This is kind of the, uh, the way that alpha zero looks at this position. We get a trade and the other rook comes to d1 as we've highlighted. Knight e6, another trade, no problem if you're alpha zero. And as soon as the queen lodges herself on h6, we're going to see the natural plan that we've talked about only a matter of time that was going to come, which is white's going to start pushing forward on the king side. One thing that's interesting is you see that Stockfish's approach over the last several moves, where the way Stockfish would like to play a lot of positions, saying, I'm up a pawn. I have material, that's, that's a good thing, right? That's how I've been taught by human beings to think about chess. But apparently Alpha Zero, being allowed to do machine learning organically on his own, has better ideas of what the long-term compensation is. Uh, what I'm saying is that white is, white is still in a, in a very controlling position on the board to attack, despite the fact that Stockfish feels that he's coordinated, held on to his extra pawn, and actually trade it off pieces. You're not supposed to be able to get a really great mating attack when there's not that many minor pieces left on the board. But the point is that if you look at this position from the other angle, it almost reminds you of short Timon, where yes, black has been able to trade off some of the minor piece pressure with the knights coming off the board. And yes, black is still up that pawn. But the main thing is that white controls all the cards. You almost wish that this king could go on some kind of journey and pop itself on f6 and we'll get a mate on g7, a la the game I talked about with short and Timon. But that's not, one, that's not going to happen here. But two, the point is I'm just reminding us of that really legendary game. Just Google short Timon king walk if you haven't seen that amazing game and you'll see it. Just to highlight the fact that black is frozen. So it's not so much that black has been able to simplify and liquidate pressure. The problem is black is really not able to do anything. Really, at this point, Stockfish is begging white to take the d-pawn because if white had taken the d-pawn instead of that, now you'll see rook d8 and black will start to get the compensation that he wants to get in this type of game or, or get the freedom that he needs. Um, if the d-pawn disappears. Of course, also moves like queen a4, uh, queen takes a2, and other ideas would be another reason why white might eventually regret opening the d-file, just to note. But I was just sort of highlighting the key idea there, that white doesn't want to take it. So after h4, queen a5, uh, the threat there, everybody, was to move queen e1 check, followed by takes e5. 
So of course, uh, Alpha Zero not interested. Now after C4, renewing the threat of the Queen gobbling up the E5 pawn, Alpha Zero remains uh, in, in the driver's seat here by refusing for the position to change. Queen check, King G2, now Stockfish does the best he can to create counterplay. And if you look at the evaluation bar to the left of our board, you'll see that Stockfish still feeling comfortable. That of course is the evaluation of the world's former maybe strongest chess engine, uh, still feeling like black is doing okay here. You give it more time to think, it does think white has compensation. But really, if you look at this from a human perspective, and knowing how this game went, we already feel like white is almost totally winning here, not just a little advantage. After h5, black still has a lot, of, uh, a lot, of, a lot to do about nothing, lack of options. Black is going to sit tight with rookie 7. Now that we've got pressure on the square g6, you're going to see white try to maneuver to create tactical opportunities uh, with this bishop popping back and forth potentially to these two diagonals, working with the rook and uh, queen together over there. The bishop comes to d1, now comes to b3, and after the move rook to d8, rook f3, this is when things start to get a little fun, and, and we, we're going we're gonna to highlight that after the move queen e4, queen d2, if you're stockfish, they're you want to start looking for ways to activate because we start to see the writing on the wall. White wants the pawn on h6. These rooks are going to be frozen. If they ever move, the d7 pawn might fall, which of course opens up everybody and their cousin for a party on f7. Uh, plus, if h6 is established, then you know this king is going to have long-term back rank issues. So what, what about a move like knight c5 here for black? Would that have helped to try to eliminate this light square bishop and hit the e5 pawn? Well, after h takes g6, h takes g6, we start to see some really, really amazing lines here, starting with the move queen to g5, hitting the rook on e7 and highlighting why this knight should have never have left e6. If knight takes b3, we'll just highlight that just in case you're wondering why it's just taking on e7 and there's no time for black to try to gobble and stay equal because white is winning this rook with check, followed by taking back the knight here, white's going to be up a whole rook. So that's not an option. That means after queen g5, you're going to have to protect this rook on e8. But now the, sw the rook swings from d4 over to h4, and a mating net will ensue unless black is willing to play for some sort of endgame like queen takes e5. But here, white would just go and win the exchange and go on to win an, an endgame easily. So that's an example of where black is, is really tough, right? Again, it seems solid, but black really is lacking moves here. So after queen to g4, which was played, the bishop came back to d1. The queen came back to e4. White establishes this pawn on h6. It's really a grind here. Alpha zero is gripping that king side till eventually put black in a position where he has even less moves than he's currently had with all the queen shuffling, right? We're hoping to get black in a position where he's running out of squares altogether. Knight to c7 makes sense. And after rook d6, again, the first thing we have to look at is why didn't Stockfish just take the pawn? First, rook takes is off the table because if the d7 pawn falls, now that the h6 square has, uh, h6 pawn, excuse me, has taken away the g7 square, the back rank mating nets are, are going to be too much for black to deal with. Queen takes e5 is the other option, but we're going to see a really fun common theme here that white could have skewered, followed by f4, and this queen is simply overworked, unable to deal with the rook on e7. So after knight e6 and rook to d6, or sorry, after, after knight, knight back to c7, uh, and then the rook came to d6, that's why that pawn was untakeable. So black comes right back. We have to continue to prevent this threat of queen to g5. That's what Stockfish is trying to do. But here the bishop comes back to b3, and we see a position that's very similar to what we had just a few moves ago, but the improvements for white are on the board. This pawn is no longer on h5, it's on h6. Uh, black still can't really touch any of these pawns or do anything to free up the d-file and with these new open lines created white is white is even more in the uh kind of uh, we'll call it the boa stricter position black takes the pawn on e5 and that would be maybe what stockfish's plan was all along not realizing that according to alpha zero this really is only going to help white get more pressure but after takes rook d5 queen h8 Here's, here's where the gloves start to come up. This queen gets the diagonal she's been waiting for, whether it was g5, sorry, the h4, d8 way to get the rook on e7, or the a3, f8 way. As soon as that threat happens, black is really under the gun because this rook can't safely leave the seventh rank with moves like rook back to e8. Well, for a number of reasons. One, the pawn on f7, is it's only a matter of time before it comes under fire. But here there's actually a simple move like queen a4. Uh, and white's going to start gobbling up things. If black is just in a position where he has nothing, nothing better than to just play tickle, gobbling a7, followed by gobbling b6, is going to create a new problem for black. Principle of two weaknesses, uh, the a file and the a pawn becoming a queen will, will make black also hurt for the fact that his pieces are stuck on the king side. So, um, 
After rook d5, queen h8, queen b4, Stockfish does exactly what he had in mind, and that you see from the initial evaluation, why can't I just put the knight on c5? Haven't I finally worked my way out of this mess? Not so fast. Rook takes c5. Uh, call it a double x clam, call it a single x clam, call it just an exchange sack that to all of us makes sense given the way this game has gone. B takes c5, the key point is not that you're taking back on c5, okay? This would allow a move like d6, and finally that d7 pawn that has been crippled the whole game gets to move to protect the rook, and black is probably in a position where some freedom can happen here. I think white's compensation is still really tricky, but, but the, uh, it's not nearly as clear as it could be. The idea is we're not taking back there, we're playing queen h4, hitting the rook again, the rook cannot move off of the seventh rank because f7 falls with devastating effects. And after the rook is guarded, finally the brilliant idea that almost comes full circle on black's initial problems in this queen's Indian pawn sack, right? Pieces being cramped and kind of stuck over here on the queen side to, to the position we now have where the queen is completely frozen on h8. Just amazing. Uh, take a look at the theme we've been talking about with black really feeling like he was just strangled and didn't have a lot of moves. As soon as he thinks he's getting some freedom and white has to give up the exchange, it gets worse. The rook on e7 is stuck. The queen on h8 is stuck. Nothing can really move here besides the pawns. And that's kind of what happens. After the queen comes to f4, only ganging up on f7, still everybody and their cousin is, is stuck to guarding this weakness on f7 or the king. What I said is true. Literally, we're down to pawn moves. Black is going to push some pawns, do what uh, computers do best, just kind of push the pawns forward till we run out of moves. Uh, note that a move like rook d4 is never possible due to several versions of mate, but I'm going to show you my favorite one because isn't rook takes f7, rook takes f4, and rook g7 double check and mate. Pretty darn sexy, right? So that's a, that's a reason why that rook can never leave. Only a few more moves, a matter of technique. The pawn comes to a3. After queen f3, you really see that black is running out of time. Once the a3 pawn falls, if black just sits any further, call it rook c8 or somewhere on the seventh rank, the queen will come back to f3. And this continued battery on f7, followed by the new problem of rushing the a pawn up the board, is enough for black to just resign. So Stockfish, seeing the writing on the wall, uh, so to speak, finally decides he needs to do something to get activity as computers do. Probably a human would have already resigned uh, and just gives up the queen. The rest is a, a matter of technique. Not sure if Alpha Zero really speaks Russian schoolboy, but if he does, he did show some pretty darn good Soviet school technique here. The game is over. Game three was in the books. And with that, the chess world turned upside down. Please stay tuned for the rest of the, uh, the games in this series. Of course, we're going to be bring, bringing you all of our favorites with as much instructive commentary as we can. Uh, this is what happens when two titans of the chess world coming from the Silicon Valley angle meet. And uh, congratulations to AlphaZero for taking Game 3 versus Stockfish in their match.